Welcome to Board Gamers Now, this is the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. And this is episode 260. If you backed Return to Dark Tower, try these other games. we like to thank all of our Patreon backers that helped us bring you a brand new episode. All right, Anthony, so there is a lot going on. And especially in board gaming, a lot of great conventions are coming up. We will be at Dreamation in Morristown, New Jersey next week. So we mentioned this already, but of course, if you are in the New Jersey area and you happen to be there, you know, hit us up because we would love to get a game with you. And we have some really interesting things coming up, Anthony, right? We have some friends joining us at the table. Yeah, yeah, we've, um, so you guys heard the first last week, we're doing a brand new series of features, uh, our friends' favorite games, and it's going to be a combination of Patreon backers, personal friends, designers, publishers, podcasters, so every three to four weeks or so, we're going to bring someone on, we're going to talk to them for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe longer, about their favorite game and why they love it and why you should play it, so... We have several of those lined up, um, including the designer of our number one game from 2019, uh, Raymond Chandler, who who made City of the Big Shoulders. I'm really excited to hear like his favorite game and how that informed the game that we ended up loving the most last year, as well as several other people we have lined up in the next few weeks. So we're pretty excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's a cool way to look outside of kind of our little ecosphere of games that we regularly play and types of games we play and Maybe get a, a deeper dive into some stuff that, you know, the people in the hobby are playing constantly, right? Absolutely. I think that there are a lot of great games out there that may be sitting somewhere in your collection or maybe something that you've never thought about. So we love bringing passion for board gamings to the table and obviously bringing our friends to the table each and every week. So please, if you'd like to join us at the table Check us out at patreon.com slash BGA. And obviously, there's a, so many ways to reach out to us on social media. And we'd love to hear from you. But, you know, also, please tell a friend. Getting board gaming out there is what we're here to do. So get more people to the table and get the more people to BGA. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with us and with some of our listeners out there. Let's talk about what's going on with our question of the week. Question of the week. What is the best game if you have very limited or no setup time and you just want to get the game out and start playing immediately? So obviously there's going to be shorter games, quicker games, lighter games, not exclusively, but generally. So a listener's chimed in with a few. Andrew said, no, thanks. Skull from Chris. Um, We had Flux from David. Uh, Daniel uh, trolled us with Gloomhaven because that's the opposite of quick. So thanks for that. Um, (laughs) and for me personally, and Garamea also mentioned Castles of Burgundy, the dice game, but the one that I was going to say was really any roll and write because roll and writes are pieces of paper, pencil, some dice, and then you just run through the rules, ready to go. There's no components. There's no anything additional to go with that. It's just dice, paper, pencil, done. Um, I don't know that there's anything like in a big box that really fits this. I couldn't think of anything, at least nothing in my collection that didn't take at least 10 or 15 minutes to set up, unless it's a game I've played like 100 times. But, you know, for quick games and if you're looking for something with a lot of depth to it, one deck games like, you know, Race for the Galaxy or something, maybe would fit into that bucket. But for the most part, it's going to be quicker, shorter, lighter stuff, right? Yeah, I think San Juan is the game that always pops into my mind because San Juan's always about building a tableau up. And you build the buildings in your tableau based upon the cards you have in your hand. So the cards are the tableau, the cards are the currency, and other than a couple of pieces that go to the middle as as far as picking your particular role, that's it in a nutshell. You open the box, you put that in the stack, you hand out the cards, you put the pieces out in the middle, and you're done. I, I think you can you know set that game up in like less than a minute. I think the only game that I consistently, as you mentioned, Anthony, a big box game that gets to the table that really has really very little, if no setup time. I know this is going to sound crazy, but but go with me for a second. Blood Rage. Now, Blood Mm -hmm. Rage has a ridiculous number of pieces, and it also has crazy inserts. So clearly that's a challenge. But as far as the setup is concerned, you got the board, you got your player boards, 
everything's flat, not, not a problem. You put your Yerk to sell out there, which is another piece of flat paper. And then you have the round markers, which again, flat paper. And, but you don't set up the soldiers. You don't set up the monsters because unless you pull the particular cards, those don't come into play. So they could literally stay in the box until you're, you know, have a situation where you need them on the field. So again, it does have a ridiculous number of pieces, but unless the cards come out, unless you choose to do so, not much is needed to set up previously, but throughout the game, you'll be pulling stuff onto the board. It's not bad, for sure. Like, it's certainly smaller and quicker than it seems like it'll be. Yeah. But, man, there's a lot of plastic in that box. There's a ton of plastic. Like I said, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't pull out, then it stays in. You know, we played the, with the new version and we had all the stuff in the box and we were like, all right, I, I get the sea monster and we have to pull that out. But as far as setups concerns, pretty quick. And also, I, I guess this is generally the rule set. The player board that's placed out there on the very bottom tells you exactly what the actions do and how much energy they take up. So there really isn't a lot of rule book reading. And especially for a game that has, you know, somewhat a pretty decent complexity. I'm always surprised that you can actually get Blood Rage to the table. Now, Rising Sun is a completely mm -hmm. different story, but uh, Blood Rage, at least for a big box game, so to speak. All right, so that's everything that's going on with our question of the week. If you'd like to join the growing numbers of people that are letting us know what they're thinking at the table, please, Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, pretty much anywhere that you can find board gaming on the internet, we are there in some particular feature and we would love to hear from you all right anthony that's what's going on with our listeners let's get on to what's going on with us at the table let's talk about our acquisition disorders all right yes so i'm returning to kickstarter and don't, if you haven't noticed no, in recent don't go there man <laughs> don't stay away man it's just gonna take all your money <laughs> i've been doing good lately i've been doing for me i've been doing good um i do have a public kickstarter profile if anybody wants to follow it feel free several people have taken the liberty to do so and i've been fairly good the last six months or so i've only backed stuff i was really interested in as well as expansions for games i really like so either it's a new lacerda game or it's an expansion for a game i already own or it's like a game by a designer i really like like cole whirly and oath right so this is one of those three things it is an expansion for parks this was a light fairly accessible family weight game uh from keymaster games that came out just this last year it was on kickstarter last year but it released at gen con this year and it is based on the 59 parks art series uh which is just absolutely beautiful artwork of the national parks throughout the united states just some of the most iconic and beautiful representations of these parks that you'll ever see and while i have not been to all 59 i've been to a decent number of them, at least out West when I used to live in Seattle and uh, in the area out there. So it's just really cool to see things that I recognize and that I've been to. And it's just, I don't know, it's just part of my personal history. So I really, really enjoy this. Mechanically speaking, it's very light. Uh, it's got like a Takedo like element where you're moving two different people down the track and taking actions based on where you land. And, and for the most part, you're taking photographs or, exploring the park, getting different cards, and ultimately picking up different resources from your time in the park that will allow you to pick up the larger park cards. And essentially, thematically, what you're doing is visiting those parks. And whoever visits the most parks and has the best time wins the game. So if you played Takedo, kind of the same thing. And mechanically, kind of the same thing, but like a little more depth to it. So it is not the heaviest or you know, deepest game you'll ever play. But if you're looking for like a family game, that's beautiful. It's great artwork, especially if you travel a lot as a family. This is just spot on. I love it. So when they said there was an expansion coming, I was like, I'm on board. This is awesome. I'm 100% there. And it's called Nightfall. It's relatively inexpensive. I think just getting the expansion by itself is $22 on Kickstarter. So it's not a ton of additional money. You're going to get a new pack of park cards, so new artwork for all the different parks. Um, you're going to get new wildlife tokens. So the original version of the game has like these little wooden tokens of like moose and different types of animals that you might run into. So now you have owls and bunnies and wild cats and all sorts of cool stuff. There's a new year deck 
that basically every year when you're running through the game, there's going to be different conditions that change how the, the flow of the game goes. So kind of like an event deck, but a little bit different. So there's new one of those. And there's a new action added to the game, a camping trail action. So in the original game, you have to get from the start to the end of the row in the one day because the sun's going down. And so if everybody gets to the end and you're still out there, you have to follow them into the end because it's dark and you don't want to get lost in the park, right? So now you have a camping trail action where you can stop and camp on different cards uh, with your camping tokens, which just lets you kind of play with the mechanics a little bit. Again, none of these things are like crazy overcomplicating the game, but it just adds a little bit more depth and just a ton of more artwork. So I'm on board just instantly because I love this game. Um, there's also a like a secondary piece to this, uh, Parks Memories, which is a strategic matching game. There's three different boxes that you can pick up, different sets. And I don't know, it's a matching game with like special powers and ability tokens. It's not really for me. I'm keeping an eye on it. It might be something for my kids. I don't know, but it's just, it's the same artwork that we already have in the base game. I'm taking a new mechanic, just make it a little more accessible for a wider group of people. Um, if you have smaller children, if it's something you're interested in, take a look at it. It's it's an option. You don't have to back it you know, with Nightfall. You can just back it independently or you can pick up everything together. So they have like the box set with all of the memories. They have the box set with the base game and Nightfall and all the memories. You can do everything together if you want to um, with some Kickstarter exclusives, but Generally, there's not a ton of that stuff. There's like little enamel pins and whatnot. But if you've traveled a lot, if you've seen the national parks, if you've seen this artwork and just love it, uh, if you're looking for another like family weight type of game like Takedo, but more American themed, um, you know, if you travel domestically, then this is definitely a game worth checking out. So for me, it was perfect. And I think a lot of people really enjoy it if you haven't checked it out yet. So. That is Parks Nightfall. It's on Kickstarter right now. Runs through February 25th. And uh, I would recommend at least the base game that I've played. But Nightfall looks pretty good as well. Yeah, I remember us talking about this way back when, when the first version came out on Kickstarter. And as you mentioned, it does definitely have that Takedo kind of feel to it as far as marching down this Pramorana and just picking up tokens and then trading things in. And as you said, it's it's a very light kind of game, but it's very picturesque. <laughs> no pun intended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how this is not something that you don't add to your collection unless you find it a little too costly. I think that's the one thing that might push you off a bit because since it is so elaborately simple, although the artwork is pretty fantastic, um, I could see maybe holding off on it, but you know, if this definitely fits your weight class, so to speak, and as Anthony was mentioning, especially if you have kids and you want to have that matching game, you know, I don't think you could do, you know, much better than than uh, Parks here. Just because, you know, Takedo has that kind of zen feel at the table where you're enjoying this wondrous, you know, journey and there's so much to kind of absorb and this is very much a very American experience about our wondrous environment that is so precious to us. And Anthony's been to a lot of these things. I have not, but I, you know, I, I was a boy scout, so <laughs> I have a good appreciation for the parks. Uh, if it wasn't for my allergies, I probably would be at a lot more, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is something that everyone should at the very least check out. And I absolutely, absolutely adore the whole night version because my favorite part of nature happens to be the sky and just the stars and everything there. So yeah, check it out. You have until Tuesday, February 25th to back it. All right, Anthony. So we are going to talk about another Kickstarter. And if it's a Kickstarter and if it's miniatures, it's more than likely going to be Simon. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to be Simon these days, it's going to be an IP and, Watch your wallets, kids. It's Marvel Unlimited. Take the role of Marvel's mightiest heroes and thwart, I love that word, thwart, the villain's plans in this fast-paced cooperative game with action sculpts. I'm sorry, amazing sculpts. I said action sculpts. 
so this is really interesting because this is yet another one of those CMON games that has, again, they've outdone themselves as far as miniatures are concerned. Again, if you do like what is these chibi looking superheroes, but really fantastic models. And this is probably why if you do back the game, you're backing it for the miniatures. And the game itself is, as, as I mentioned earlier, is a co-op game. So basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be selecting a number of heroes based upon the number of players in the game as a, as a co-op. So two to four players. And the game plays in about, I would say, about 40 minutes, maybe a little bit less. Again, again, it's a co-op game. So it's going to be one of those variable ending situations. So you can knock out the bad guy really quick or you could be knocked out just as quick. And again, based upon how many players you have in the game, I'm assuming you could obviously play this solo as well. Uh, you know, it's a co-op game. So you pick your heroes. The, each of the heroes has their own little unique deck. And this is obviously on the lighter side. So you are going to have a limited number of actions that the cards are going to be able to give you. So you're going to have your movement action. You're going to have your special heroic action. You're going to have your attack action and basically the game all comes down to stopping the master plan that the villain has put out there so in the base set you're going to get red skull and the heroes are going to be the hulk iron man black widow captain marvel and captain america now i'll talk about at the end where everything else kind of you know completely goes off the rails <laughs> but basically the game itself you pick your heroes and what's going to happen is the bad guy's going to come out there and they're going to take their actions, which are basically going to add threat and move down its marker towards victory. Your job is to be able to do a number of different area kind of cleanse because you're going to have to rescue civilians. You're going to have to defeat thugs and clear different threats at different areas. If you're able to do that, then it will trigger other actions in the game, some which benefit you and some which makes the game a little harder. So the villain plays their cards, they activate their things, the heroes play their cards next, and they will allow them to move around to the different locations, slap around the bad guys, stop the bad guys from doing their particular uh, schemes. And that's pretty much in a nutshell. You're collecting actions, hopefully getting not getting knocked out, because you can get knocked out, but it's a co-op game, so you're going to come immediately back. So... To buy this game, it's $60, and they've already unlocked some of the stretch goals. So you could also pick up Nick Fury. You could pick up Hawkeye. Corvus Glaive from Infinity War is here. And there's also going to be, as I mentioned, the heroes that they talked about earlier. But there's also going to be some additional bad guys. So Beyond Red Skull is Ultron and Taskmaster. And again, this game is primarily all about the miniatures, and some really kind of cutesy artwork, so to speak. It's a CMON game, so the production's going to be fantastic. They're also adding some additional stretch goals for Iron Fist is already unlocked, Mockingbird, Luke Cage, a fantastic-looking Moon Knight, Black Hat, and they recently uh, unlocked War Machine, which I think is going to be a pretty cool miniature as well, and then one additional villain, at least currently at the time of the recording, Bullseye. But let's all be honest, you're not here for the generic stuff. You're here for the optional buy. And mm. when I looked at this, I was like, well, that's a lot of generic heroes and villains. What about the stuff that we just watched the movies on? Well, my friends, for 30 additional dollars, you can pick up the additional bad guys. So this is the Infinity Gauntlet. So you're going to pick up Thanos, Proxima Midnight, Ebony Maw, Black Dwarf. If you don't remember those names, don't worry about that. They were in Endgame. So... They're the bad guys. So, yeah, so that happened. Uh, and basically, this scenario is about collecting the Infinity Stones and stopping the mid-bosses and obviously the big bad bosses in the game. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Right now, that's all they have unlocked. I'm sure there'll be other things unlocked as the campaign moves forward. Again, Simon's about the miniatures. Simon's about the IP. This seems to be certainly in the lighter fare. This seems to be a family version of pretty much everything we've seen. And uh, if you're interested in checking out all of this very interesting, very tempting, wonderful looking little chibi Marvel miniatures, it wraps up on Wednesday, 
March 4th. <sighs> yeah, I know. Man, <laughs> I know. It's like you mentioned this before. We were talking about it, and you compared it to Masmora. Yes. Which I was like, yeah, 1,000%. <laughs> yeah. Because I look at it, and mechanically, I'm like, this doesn't look like that great of a game. It just looks like another generic co-op. But the miniatures look amazing, and I want them, and I want to paint them, and I want to have them. But I don't want all of them, and I don't want to spend $100. So, Simon, sell me Thanos, sell me Moon Knight, maybe a Hulk, and I'd be happy. (laughs) Keep everything else, I don't want it. Yeah, Simon is really, really, I mean, Simon, for lack of a better term, is the supervillain here. (laughs) They're like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we know what you want, and we know how to sell you really outstanding, little adorable little miniatures with a mediocre kind of game wrapped around it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, again, if you are susceptible to see mom miniatures, you may want to avoid this. But maybe by the end of the campaign, there will be enough miniatures that you'll feel okay with backing a $60 generic I guess, family level, big box store type of game. There's a chance. There's a chance. Yeah. Yeah. How many Kickstarter exclusives are there? We'll find out. We don't know because they did not give us a rundown of those. So, uh, yeah, they're really holding out. So we'll see. So, again, Family Weight seems like a decent kind of game and, you know, another one of those generic kind of co-op games. All right, so that's everything for our Acquisition Disorders. Anthony, let's talk about the games that did hit our table, and we'll let everyone know if those games are a buy, and they should run out and pick those games up because they're adorable, like those little miniatures from Simon. If those games are a play, and they should borrow someone's copy immediately, those games are a dodge for many reasons because of, you know, really costly miniatures, or if those games are the dreaded burn, and then they should be avoided at all costs. Anthony, what did you get to the table this week? Okay, so I have not got a chance to play this with a full group of people. I wanted to, but a couple plays here with the family, several plays solo. I feel comfortable talking about it and giving you my impressions. And that is Masters of Renaissance, Lorenzo Il Magnifico, the card game. Subtitle, subtitle, subtitle. Um, <laughs> Did they, so, do you pay for the extra subtitles? Were those like stretch goals or something? Uh, yeah, based on the price of the game, yeah, I might have. <laughs> so, um so this is a new game from cranio creations designed by simone luciani one of my all-time favorites and nestor manjon who worked on lorenzo and it is not really lorenzo except for the theme so let me let me just run through basic mechanics here you have three actions on your turn you can take resources from the market which is kind of a cool mechanic i'll get to you can pay for a development card from the tableau and add it to your own personal tableau, or you can activate all the development cards you've already purchased. The market is a series of marbles in a four by three grid. Each marble represents a different resource, and you'll pick a row or a column and take all of the resources represented by the marbles in that row or column. Um, At the beginning of the game, there are some white marbles in there. Those are worth nothing, but later in the game, you'll have leader cards that you can unlock, which could potentially make those white marbles worth something if you do that. So kind of an interesting mechanic where you can kind of manipulate that a little bit. Your own personal board only has a limited space, though. So you can only hold up to six resources in your warehouse. And the trick to this is you can have one of one, two of another, and three of another. If you ever have more than that and have to discard them, the other player is going to get faith points. And the faith point track is really just points. You know, it's not like the brutal faith point track that we had in the original game where if you didn't reach a certain point then the game basically took away powers <laughs> as the game went along so you want to move up that track it's a bunch of points but it's just points for the most part so you, you don't want to give those points to other people um, as you generate all those resources you will then spend them to purchase development cards these development cards are going to cost some amount of resources the, the level one cards tend to be like one of something and two of another you buy them you put them on your tableau there's three spaces there uh you can place a one in any of the spaces you can place a two on top of any one a three on top of any two the each of the cards comes in one of the four different suits from the base game so you have the green and the yellow and the blue and the purple and they don't really correspond in any other way because 
each of them just kind of does one thing, but all those things are fairly similar. They convert one resource into other resources. So for example, you might have a level one green card that converts one stone into one um, assistant and one faith point. So you're, you know, growing your resources. And that's the other action you can take. You can activate all the cards that are in front of you and take all those actions. So you take all the stuff that's in your warehouse. So you might have two stone and three assistants and a, a coin in your warehouse. And you put those into the different development cards that you've purchased. And you convert them either into other resources or into faith points, which you just move up your track. And once you convert them, those things go into your strong box, which is unlimited. So that's a way to like to build up a big pile of resources is just to convert them through your little engine that you're building, right? The thing about the game, though, is that the cards are generally the same. They get more powerful as you move to level two and level three. And the leader cards that you start your hand with will unlock and allow you to play them when they um, like. So one might say you need a blue card and a green card of any level. So once you have a blue card and a green card, you play your leader and now you have a new ability or, you know, some discount sometimes, whatever it might be. So similar to like the stuff you'd see in Lorenzo, but not quite as interesting. There's four of those. You can build them up over the course of the game or you can spend them for faith points, however you want to do it. The game, though, never really like it builds because you're building a tableau and you're generating resources and you're building up. But nothing ever changes. You don't get new mechanics or different discounts like the stuff you see on your leader cards. is the same from the beginning to the end of the game. The cards that are in the tableau are the same from the beginning to the end of the game. What you're available to purchase might change based on what everybody else buys. But for the most part, it's the same kind of stuff. It's, you know, spend three resources or five or seven or eight and get a card that you put in your tableau that gives you points as well as a new ability. That's it. And the game's going to end if somebody gets to the end of the faith track or if they build their seventh development card. I feel like it's almost always going to end on development cards because it's easier to get those out than it is to get the faith points up. But again, I haven't played with like a full four people yet. I like it. I don't love it. I thought I'd love it because Lorenzo is one of my favorite games. It's in my top 30, I think, uh, my top 100. And this, while it feels a little bit like Lorenzo, it's not Lorenzo. It doesn't have the same like diversity in the tableaus. Like the base game, you have, you know, your resource tableau and your your uh, merchant tableau and then your discount abilities and your end game points and you're trying to manipulate everything and everything's really, really tight and you're constantly getting mad and yelling at the game. This doesn't really have that. This also doesn't really have a way to interact with other players much. Um, the marbles move around. So when you take a row or column, you're going to move those marbles down. So one marble might drop off, which could mess with people. You could buy a development card before someone gets to it. But it's pretty easy to mitigate for because you know those things are going to happen. I don't know. It's a play. I like it. I'm probably going to keep it because it, it's different enough. Like it's a different type of game. It plays in less than an hour. So it's not like a big, long Euro. But for what it costs, you know, I think it's a $45 game, $40, $45 game. It's a full box. Like it's a big box game. There's just not enough game in here. And I just don't see it lasting. Like the replay value is just not there. So it's good. It's not great. It's decent. If you like Lorenzo, you might like it. Maybe you won't. I'm not sure. But if you like lighter, quicker card games, I think this might be more up your alley than if you're just like a straight Lorenzo fan. Um, at this point, it's hard for me to divorce the ideas of, am I disappointed because it's not Lorenzo as a card game, or is it just not that great of a game? And it's probably a little bit of both. So for me, it's like a play, probably like sitting around a seven, maybe a little below that. And yeah, I'm a little disappointed, but it's not bad either. So it's worth checking out if you have a chance to play it. Definitely not run out and buy it though, especially at this price. So that is Masters of Renaissance. Lorenzo Will Magnifico dash the card game. I think this game suffers from the same thing that the founders of Gloomhaven suffered from, which is it still has its own thing and it's not a bad game, but because they slapped the title on it, which they really didn't need to do because thematically, as you mentioned, or mechanically, as you mentioned, 
it's nothing like Lorenzo. I mean, there are some similarities as far as some of the card art is concerned and some of the resources on a very, very thin level. But beyond that, it's really a radically different game. And I know what they were trying to do as far as the marketing is concerned. And obviously, on certain cases, it, it, we all rushed out and purchased it. But on some some situations, you know, long term, long tail, so to speak, people are going to be disappointed. They could have just named this something else. And I think that we would have had lower expectations about the game because I've played this and I enjoy it, but I only enjoy it because it is so incredibly short. And if I stop to think about what I was doing, which is moving marbles on a little black tray, I would find it ridiculous. Like I'd be like, this is not Lorenzo. This isn't really much of anything. Why am I doing this? But again, it has just enough surface flavor to be, you know, remind me of Lorenzo. So it kind of brings in that nostalgia, so to speak. And it's fast enough that I don't, mind it and it doesn't overstay its welcome but just barely so uh, you know even for me it's a play yeah it's funny because it's a euro theme right like lorenzo the euro and you're taking the theme from a euro and attaching it to another game euros aren't that thematic guys what are you doing (laughs) just make it something different it didn't need to be this so there are pieces of it in there and maybe they started from Lorenzo and said, let's make a card game out of it. But I kind of find that hard to believe because based on what came out of this, this could have been anything. This could have been something else. could have been any theme. Lorenzo, like any Euro feels like it could have been any theme, but at the same time it did work for what it did. And I think it fits into that idea and the characters are very well thought out and they have names and, you know, their abilities match who those people were historically. It's not the most thematic Euro in the world, but it tries a little This one is none of that. It's just kind of slapped on. And again, that's I'm talking about a little bit too much, but that's part of my disappointment, I think, is because I thought it would be X, the card game, like Castles of Burgundy, the card game is one of my favorite, the card games, because it takes the core mechanics of that game and boils it down into a card game. This does not do that. So it's a little disappointing in that way. Yeah, I would uh, completely agree with that. And especially with the price tag being so high, too. I think, you know, Oof. Castles, the Burgundy, the card game is, what, 15 bucks? Yeah, this is over 40 yeah. which is insane. Yep. All right, so I wanted to talk about a game that I got to the table. I know a friend of mine, Chris, is really excited to learn more about Vindication. <laughs> now, Vindication, formerly known as Epoch the Awakening, was a Kickstarter game. And it's basically a strategic fantasy-based tabletop sandbox game. It plays two to five players, and it's about 30 minutes a player for the game. Now, anytime you deal with a sandbox game, you're going to get a lot of variety to the game. Now, sometimes that's a positive, sometimes that's a negative. I'm going to give you my initial reaction to the first game I played. I'm hoping to get more games to the table of this, and I'm also looking forward to getting its module expansions to the table, and I'll explain why. So Vindication, again, as I mentioned, is a sandbox game. So you wash up on the shore of this island and you're not really sure too much what's going on. And you are a wretched little character that has been thrown to fate and you have your player character that (laughs) reflects this. So as a wretched character, so to speak, you are going to have a limited ability as far as what resources you're going to be able to generate. But not to worry, you can actually vindicate yourself, and I'll explain why and how you could do that later. And then you'll get kind of a buff as far as uh, action ability will allow you to do. Now, the game itself is resource management. There'll be cubes in this game, so despite the fact that it has a very fantasy kind of theme to it, you'll be managing cubes for, I would say, 90% of the game. And basically, you are controlling particular areas on the board, because as I mentioned earlier, you land on this island that's undiscovered. And as you walk around, you will pull tiles from a bag and basically set up the map. So you and your other, I would say, competitors, but there is really no interaction in the game. So basically, I guess they are playing side by side, so to speak, but they are competitors as far as who's ever trying to get the highest score wins. So... You'll go out there, you will set up the map, you will try to control certain areas, you will manage resources, and you will pick up other characters and 
relics and special abilities throughout the game, which are in the form of cards particularly. But basically, it's a cube management game that is has a very fantasy theme to it. So again, the game itself is really interesting as far as what they're trying to present here. So you have a unique character, and it has these really nice little bin setups that you know has your character card, it has your little movement piece, and then it's going to have all of your cubes, not to mention your movement tiles. Now, the movement tiles in the game start at two movement, and then eventually, as the game goes on, you'll be able to move your character a little bit further. It's also going to have your player board, which you're going to manage your resources in the game. The resources in the game are going to be your potential. So it's going to be these cubes that are going to be starting typically in a potential area that's then going to move to an influence area. And once it's in the influence area, that's when you'll be able to influence spots on the board. I'll talk about that in a second. And finally, there is the conviction area. Now, as you move the cubes to this final area, that's going to give you the little most power as far as the cubes are concerned. Those cubes are going to be used to control certain areas of the map and also be able to draw additional cards and save particular characters that are under your control. So again, you wash up on shore, you're going out to explore this island, tiles will come out with special abilities. Most of those abilities are to obtain cubes or to utilize cubes. And the game utilizes this really interesting color mechanic. In the game itself, you'll be able to generate, just based on your hero power, red, yellow, and blue. So you'll make the additional secondary colors by combining colors, and in this case, by combining cubes, that will give you the opportunity to purchase additional cards in the game that will get you special power-ups, special abilities, special endgame bonuses, allow you to fight monsters, let you to have companions that will allow you to have additional actions in the game. And basically, the game comes down to three primary actions. You're going to activate a companion, or yourself, of course, travel to a new location, and then interact with one of those map pieces. That's pretty much in a nutshell. Sometimes there's a little AP as far as where you're going to go and how you're going to combine the cubes. But basically, the game is move, do a thing as far as a map title, or you can rest in the game that will also give you an opportunity to do things. And, you know, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So... You will be doing that until the game meets one of its end conditions. There is one set in the game, but there will also be additional end conditions that will pop up. And those will also be random for the game. Sometimes it's collecting a certain number of points. Sometimes it's collecting a certain number of resources or collecting one of each of the color cards. So you're never really particularly sure when the game's going to come to an end because those cards come out. And based upon people's conditions, those games could lock up pretty quickly. We ran a full game and there was actually nothing but the final score that kind of wrapped up the game. We didn't hit any of those final conditions until the very end. This is relatively an interesting, a I, I won't say like it's not a, a Meritrash fantasy game, but it does have that look, it has that very stylized uh, fantasy look to it and the artwork is very good it also comes with some miniatures that come into play with the you know module expansions and it has a very interesting euro mechanic because basically the game is swapping in and out cubes for resources it's a sandbox game there's a lot of ways to go there's a lot of things to collect in the game you could fight monsters you can collect you know relics there's a whole bunch of different things to do in the game it didn't really give me a feel for the theme as so much as far as like this fantasy element kind of thing, but it does do enough that I would be interested in playing the game again. So somewhat abstracted, somewhat long in the tooth because it is a sandbox game. So, you know, I did have a long wait between terms. We did have a full player count as far as the game's concerned, but you're basically running around swapping cubes in and out. So for Vindication, for at least an initial play, it does get a play for me, and I would be I would welcome another play of the game now that I know more about the cards, how they do, and also more about you know where I can get some of those end game bonus cards that's going to score me additional points. But beyond that, you know the characters, the artwork, the production, of the game is quite good. The attempt, at least to create a story with your special character kind of intro and your secret, you know, quest 
is somewhat kind of surface level engaging. I'm looking forward to playing the modules. Maybe it adds more to the game. Vindication, get to play. I picked this up at Gen Con and haven't even opened it yet. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and like based on like people said it was more or less what you described, like Euro-ish mechanics in an Ameritrash package. And I was like, ooh, that seems like a kind of thing I might like. Uh, I haven't played it yet, so... You always beat me to it. <laughs> well, this is what happens. I, I sneak into your house and I play your games in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, this is well, way creepier than what I'm thinking. But yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it has all the trappings, so to speak, especially if you incorporate the miniatures, which doesn't add a lot to the game, really, so to speak. But it gives at least a little more of a look of that stuff. I wish there was more interaction. There is zero interaction with the characters. I believe some of the cards in the modules bring some interactions into play, but there really is kind of like boats passing in the night kind of situation. So if you like that kind of look with Euro mechanics as far as swapping out in and out cubes in a sandbox game, yeah, this is for you. All right, so that's everything that's hitting our table this week. Let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, it's a brand new feature. We are revising and updating if you like try these other games with if you backed because man kickstarter is a thing these days return to dark tower try these other games so anthony i don't know about you but i have a somewhat of a nostalgic itch for return to dark tower because back in the day i did play dark tower i did not own dark tower unfortunately It was one of those kind of like super electronic games that made all these really cool little sounds and noises back in the day where you couldn't do those things with anything else out there. And it really gave me that kind of like, you know, feel for like Dungeons and Dragons because, oh, it's making a sound and it's it's really creepy and we have to do these things and we could lose the game and it's a really cool tower. And forever, I've been looking at this game, and it usually kind of hung around maybe about $150 for a used copy. And I always thought about it, but it was always a very thin game, so to speak. It was just pure nostalgia. How about you, Anthony? Any any kind of like, do you remember this game? Did you ever play this game? Did you ever even hear about this game? Nope. All right. None of those. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, we talked about this a few years ago with Fireball Island, and that is one that I remember and saw on TV, saw the commercials, friends had it, I played it, and I was very nostalgic for it, and eventually got it, and I was like, uh, okay, I guess kids are dumb. I don't know. <laughs> like, they don't, it's easy to please a child. Um, Dark Tower was a little before my time. I think this was a couple years before I was even born. And so by the time I would have been interested in anything like this, I don't even know if it was still around. I certainly didn't know anybody who owned it. I didn't know it existed until I got into like hobby board games and people started talking about like the old out of print stuff they really loved. So I'm more of an outsider looking in on this one, uh, which made which made the recent Kickstarter very interesting to watch. <laughs> so Restoration Games released Dark Tower and also released Fireball Island. And basically their whole company is based on bringing old games and restoring them and and also updating them so one of the things that we are able to see here with return to dark tower from the original dark tower is they slapped on more of a game here now i haven't played return to dark tower so i can't speak to directly if the mechanics or the game is better itself but it does have a significant pedigree we have isaac childress in here and we have rob davio that are adding to the game so especially from gloomhaven kind of fame you know, there is a good reason to take a look at this. Now, this Kickstarter backed on February 11th, 2020, and it backed at a large amount of money. It was over $4 million for this. In fact, if you are somewhat still interested in this, you can still back the pre-order. I will mention that there isn't anything Kickstarter exclusive here. So if you don't mind waiting a couple of months until this comes out retail, you might be able to find this cheaper later on. And especially you might actually be able to get this to the table because the full package pledge of this was $225. So it was Mm. rather expensive. But the game is all about, again, the Dark Tower. So the Dark Tower and with this version, the app, 
really builds in the co-op version of the play. And it really kind of is all about the lands being corrupted. So you and your heroes go around to, you know, safeguard the land, cleanse the buildings in order to, you know, keep your or to benefit from your special abilities. If those lands get corrupted, you lose a lot of things, including your special abilities and some of the actions you're able to take. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Again, we have not gotten a chance to get this to the table, so can't speak too much to the gameplay, but that's pretty much it. So we want to talk about other games that you might want to try out if you did back Dark Tower and, you know, you want to get something to the table that has similar feel. So Anthony and I put together six games based upon two different areas here that we thought that you really might like. So Anthony, why don't you start us off on your area? All right. Yeah, so I took the electronic end of things because it's kind of the thing that I think personally I feel like Dark Tower is known for. Um, just looking at the gameplay and having seen it in action. And there's not a lot of electronic games out there. This is not a thing that you see a lot in board gaming in general. It was like it was a craze in the 80s. So there are certainly a lot of those games like let's take Battleship and make it electronic and let's take Stratego and make it electronic, but not like designed from the ground up. But there are a few exceptions. Um, the first of these and probably the highest rated of these is Vlada Shavatul's Space Alert, which is a little bit polarizing, I think, for some people, but those who love it absolutely love it. And I feel like for good reason. It is a real time cooperative game that, when it shipped, came with a CD that you'd put in and it would have audio effects and sounds and timers on it that would guide you through these very, very difficult and often very unique stages based on certain elements of the gameplay right and at this point you know these types of things have been upgraded with apps and augmented with different things but this game was unique and different and well ahead of its time and has held up pretty well i mean it's a solid representation of what you can do with an electronic based focus in a board game like this and of course it's vlada shavatul so who does something completely different and unique and diff- interesting in all of his games but the fact that this came out 12 years ago, like before smartphones were even really a thing, and it still holds up, is impressive and speaks to the quality of, of what he was able to pull off. Uh, the next one here on the list is also cooperative, much, much quicker, uh, and much louder, I guess I would say. It is Escape, The Curse of the Temple. So this one came out in 2012, and again doesn't use like the modern um, apps that everything is using these days when it's electronic, it uses a CD and it is a much shorter game. The game takes about 10 minutes or so to play through. But of course, if you're playing this, you're playing multiple times through it. And the idea is you're going into a temple, you're trying to retrieve different pieces of treasure and uncover different secrets and then get out of there as quickly as you can. So there is dice rolling. It is generally cooperative, but it is of course real time and you have to move as quickly as you can within the time frame. So if you're at a convention and you're overhearing people play this game, and it's the kind of game that people will go to a convention to play because it's been out of print for a while now, so it's decently hard to find. It is loud. People are yelling. They're excited. They're Once that thing triggers and says, you need to get out now, people are very quickly rolling their dice and trying to get out. There is a uh, slightly newer version that came out in 2014 called escape zombie city um not nearly as highly rated but if you prefer zombies and kind of the same mechanic it does offer that it is the both of these are fairly on the lighter end they're generally very accessible i think escape zombie city is actually something you can still buy whereas uh, escape from the temple is currently out of print although it is queen games so you know give them some time there'll be a kickstarter around soon enough but if you want something quick and family weight these are good ones to go with And then the last one I wanted to mention, and this one does use an app because it came out in 2017, so it finally hit in that time period when everything got an app, but has a similar feel to it, is Rising 5 Runes of Asteros. So this one is a fairly 
straightforward uh, cooperative game in which you are trying to deduce various things based on the cards that you draw and the the layout of the board, but it's all kind of filtered through an app. So the app will, you'll start the game, you'll run the app, it'll tell you kind of the setup of the game that's going to go, you'll punch in information throughout the game to the app to kind of define what's happening on the board. But at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out certain elements of the board and where things are supposed to be located and what's coming in, how quickly to react. It's a very like high level science fiction um, type of game. And it's relatively simple as well. Like I didn't find it super complicated. You're just trying to crack a code basically with the different runes that are on this planet that you're exploring. But it's clever. It's interesting. It's light. It's accessible. Uh, it didn't super click with me necessarily. But I feel like as my kids get older, and I've, this is one I've held on to for that reason, as my kids get hold, older, it's going to be one that's much more accessible to bring out and play with them because it is all self-contained in just a handful of cards and a fairly simple board in the app. And it kind of gave me a similar feel to what you see with like a dark tower where it's all there. It's very thematic. It pulls you in and it's, it's pretty to look at too, because it's got Vincent de Troyes artwork. So that's rising five runes of Asteros. I think it was a little bit buzzy when it came out, but it's fallen off pretty quickly. So worth checking out still available if you're interested. All right, and for me, I want to talk about fantasy co-op games. These are games that are all based in high fantasy, bringing your players together to defend or to take down the evil that's corrupting the land. Very much very Dark Tower, so to speak. So first up is my favorite game of all time, Defenders of the Realm. Now, Defenders of the Realm is one of the most fantastic games. It utilizes a lot of the wonderful mechanics from Pandemic, and it's all about this darkness that's spreading across the medieval lands. And you and your companions with their specialized individual powers are running around the lands in order to be able to meet up with new allies, gain special abilities, hear about secrets about where the enemy is moving next, and dealing with these four different factions of baddies that are heading down towards your kingdom. So you will work together, co-op, pull together cards in order to take out those generals, play those cards at the appropriate points, and then roll a whole bunch of dice and hopefully be able to knock them out. I really never had more fun, you know, playing a co-op game than I have with Defenders of the Realm. Next up is Legends of Andor. Legends of Andor accomplished something that I don't think that any other fantasy co-op game or I guess solo game has done is it takes the fantasy theme and it does something radically different. It is not a slash and hack type of game. It's not a dungeon crawl type of game. It is basically a strategy game that deals with, you know, uncovering and, you know, solving all these really interesting puzzles by taking the most appropriate efficient actions possible. And it really has a long kind of campaign situation because there are multitudes of of expansions for this game cosmos did a fantastic job and the price really is perfect for this game so i highly recommend legends of andor and finally if you're looking for a game that's all about cleaning the corruption of the lands working together as a team and dealing with the fantasy elements especially that kind of quick end game so to speak Spirit Island. We've talked about this a lot. It's been one of my favorite games of all time. It also reached my top number one one year. And Spirit Island's also about these individual spirits that have special abilities, asymmetrical game powers, their own deck of cards. And you're cooperating with your fellow spirits in order to push out the colonists that are corrupting the lands, working with the late the natives, and, you know, in general, putting out some really kind of crazy combos that will scare away the colonists and just wipe them away off the board. And if you don't succeed because they're pushing in, the game kind of ends immediately. So a lot of those kind of fantasy themes where it's all about fighting a back against the darkness. So there are three games in the fantasy co-op theme area. So if you backed Return to Dark Tower and you just can't wait to get some to the table, you should try out these games. But also, Anthony... We have a throwback section here. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, we thought it'd be fun because this is Restoration Games and that's what they do, right? Throwback stuff. And 
like I said, in that time from like 1981 to like 1992, there was a ton of electronic stuff. So some of the highlights from that time period, and this is actually going back even further, um, but this one's already been released by Restoration, is Stop Thief. So the original Stop Thief came out in, I believe, 1979. And it was another one of those cult classics. People were very excited for it. And the second edition from Restoration came out a couple years ago um, at the cons and uses an app, of course. So that's the thing you're going to see in all these newer versions. They replace all the electronics with an app because I guess it's easier. It's quicker to develop. I don't really know like how you know all the logistics of that works, but it's just what we're seeing, right? But the idea of this is you have a crime that's been committed. It pops up on your phone and the board game is going to kind of play out the pieces of that. But the core bits of that are going to be represented in the app. So it's essentially a hidden movement game, but with some both old school elements that you might have seen the original Stop Thief and kind of the alerts and information that gets thrown at you as you're trying to play and a little bit newer version where some of that information is a little bit better hidden than it might have been in the past. So the way the sound integrates with the game is unique and it works well with a family, you know, especially because it's not quite as cerebral as some of these um, more uh, classic hidden movement games are. Um, The next one that I wanted to mention is the Omega virus. This has not been re-released by restoration games yet, but by all accounts, they have picked up a license to it and may or may not be working on it. Uh, This one came out in 1992 uh, from Milton Bradley, and it is a deduction game again, similar to stop thief. It's sci-fi, it's space exploration. It is heavily electronic because you have the virus kind of taunting you as you're trying to move through um, this space station and decode different things and access different abilities and weapons and generally just trying to find where the virus is hiding inside the space station. So you have like these little goofy sci-fi miniatures moving around this big board and the electronic elements of the game are just basically making fun of you <laughs> if you're not getting them correct. So I'm actually pretty interested to see how this one plays out if it does get updated because this is one I did play as a child. It came out in kind of the sweet spot for me and a couple friends did own it. So I would love to see how this works in a modern version with an app, but the old school version is just super campy sci-fi fun. And then the third one is actually somewhat more recent. This one came out kind of at the tail end of my teen years and then it's Break the Safe. So Break the Safe is another real-time cooperative game. And the the idea here is that you have a limited amount of time. You're trying to break the safe, as the game uh, tells you, as like a team of secret agents. So there's like these different puzzles and elements of the game. You have just 30 minutes that kind of ticks down as you go along. And there's various different booby traps you have to uncover. And there's like a guard dog that'll come after you and a jail that you can be sent to. It's got some fairly basic mechanics mixed in, like there is legit, you know, roll, spin and move mechanics here. But I think there's some cool stuff here in the basics of the game that could be really interesting if updated to a modern version. You can actually find relatively inexpensive copies of this game too, like 10, 15 bucks by some people getting rid of it. Whether they work or not is a different question because of the electronic mechanics and it's 20 years old, but I think with the right treatment, uh, restoration, uh, this could be pretty cool. So that's Break the Safe. All right, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table.